Hey, this is Mr. Garner coming to you from my uh, living room. This is an online little kind of uh, piece about um, New Orleans, just to give you an overview on New Orleans, the geography, the, ge um, the geology, um, and then also kind of a history of the city, all the different things, the architecture, the food, the music, and give you kind of a sense of where, the, where Louis Armstrong grew up. Um, just to give you your bearings, up here, up kind of north is where the Mississippi River comes down through the Missouri, Mississippi, Arkansas. Comes back through here and then takes a really sharp bend. Um, they call it the Crescent City because of this. If we keep going um, uh, east here, this is where the, the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf of Mexico. For future reference, right there, that little square, that is Jackson Square. All right, and this is an overview of, of all the different neighborhoods. Um, French Quarter is what most people are from, most familiar with. Really. It's the, the kind of place where you would go on a vacation or um, see in movies, things like that. It's just what New Orleans looks like to most people. Um, if we go north up here, we hit Lake Pontchartrain. That's in the little inset here. And it's important to know this place because this is a place Louis Armstrong played a lot of gigs. They would play in all these different um, areas down here. Um, but then a lot of the people that lived down here would take a vacation um, up to the Lake Country or go visit the wealthier people up there and um, musicians had gigs up there too. All right, this next piece is a um, just, it's a really cool thing. It talks about the geography and um, geology of New Orleans, but it's also really cool because you get to hear um, experts from New Orleans, so you get to hear a really cool New Orleans accent. New Orleans is the newest major city of all of North America. And the reason I say that 5,000 years ago, that's not very long. Remember, the pyramids were about to come 5,000 years ago was the Gulf of Mexico. There was no land here. Uh, now, the Mountain River, which is only 600 years old, you think about that. It was probably to have buildings over in Europe that are older than then the newest land in Louisiana. It's called South Pass. It's a unique river system on the North American continent. There's no other river system that has built the amount of land and ecosystem as the Mississippi River. South Louisiana, it's been said, is not so much a place as it is a process. Uh, there have been some massive, massive changes in climate and weather through history. You've had ice ages when continuous winter happened all the way down into where the United States is now. Thousands of years ago, the glaciers started to melt. And when they did, the water had to go somewhere and it formed a river, which we call the Mississippi River. The topsoil of all of these states and parts of Canada emptied into the mouths of the Mississippi River. The river starts to fill in its valley, and then it gets to the coast. Then it starts building land out into the Gulf of Mexico. So the river is building land, building land, building land. The Mississippi River builds a delta that sticks out into the Gulf of Mexico on the south side of the United States. Even though this place looks timeless, it is the youngest land in the United States. Some of the youngest land in the world. None of the land we live on is more than a few thousand years old. Deltas began to form in coastal Louisiana. The bottom topography of the sea was right, the amount of sediment coming down, a lot of things fell into place so that a delta could begin to form. It's a large chunk of the continent. Uh, you know, any river that's going to deposit itself is going to be constantly building up new land, but it's also going to be eating it away. It's land that is in constant change. The Mississippi River is shifted a number of times during geologic time. And river systems like the Mississippi, they'll come down one channel, and then every year they flood to make the natural levee. And then after a while, they shift because they're trying to find the fastest route to the sea. As your spring floods come in, and the water spreads out, the velocity of the water slows down. It cannot support the silt that it has in it, and it drops it out over the land and rebuilds the land. The heavy things like sand fall out on the bank, and then the next heaviest fall out next, and finally it carries some of the silts and clays eight or 10 or 20 miles away. So anyway, that just gives you an overview of you know, like how New Orleans was, was made, um, really. It's kind of cool to, to see that. Um, it also gives you an idea of how humid it is. Um, all right, on with the presentation. 
So the next part is just, just stuff about New Orleans and the history, architecture, things like that. The landmass that was to become the city of New Orleans was formed in 2200 BC. And we kind of just talked about that a little bit. Before Europeans founded the settlement, the area was inhabited by Native Americans for about 1300 years. French explorers, fur trappers, and traders arrived there by the 1690s. New Orleans was founded in 1718 by the French. They selected the site for several strategic reasons and practical considerations. It was relatively high ground. It's along a sharp bend of the flood-prone Mississippi River, which thus created a natural levee, near existing trade routes, access to the Gulf of Mexico, and then it offered control of the entire Mississippi River Valley at a safe distance from Spanish and English colonial settlements. From its founding, the French intended New Orleans to be a very important colonial city. In 1722, New Orleans was made the capital of French Louisiana. For reference, you'll see over here, this is basically the 13 colonies. And then this is um, France, so you can appreciate how much territory they really controlled, even though it wasn't as settled. Um, it was for all the fur. And then this is Spain, which at that time was, was Mexico. I remember then that first screen I pointed out the little, um, little uh, white box as Jackson Square. Um, this is Jackson Square. It's in the center of the uh, touristy part of New Orleans, known as the French Quarter. And it's named after Andrew Jackson, who is the Battle of New Orleans um, hero. He fought uh, that, that battle actually just west of uh, the city of New Orleans in 1815. It was the ending of the War of 1812. And that's how he became internationally famous. So Jackson Square um, is there. Oops. In 1763, following Britain's victory in the Seven Years' War, we would call it the French and Indian War, the French colony west of the Mississippi River, plus New Orleans, was ceded to the Spanish Empire. Two massive fires in 1788 and 1794 burned the great majority of the city's buildings. Much of the 18th century architecture still present in the French Quarter is built during, afterward, uh, during the afterward, including three of the most impressive structures in New Orleans. St. Louis Cathedral, which you see over there on the screen on the right with the Andrew Jackson statue, uh, the Cabildo, and the Presbyter. The architecture, architectural character of the French Quarter, including multi-story buildings centered on inner courtyards, large decorative wrought iron, were ubiquitous in parts of uh, Spain and the Spanish colonies. In 1780, Spain and France signed the Treaty of San Ildefonso, stipulating that Spain give Louisiana back to France. In April 1803, Napoleon sold Louisiana, also known as New France, he was fighting the um, Napoleonic Wars and was running out of money, so he, um, he approached Thomas Jefferson, I think, for like $12 million and bought that. That's a huge chunk of property right there. It's called the Louisiana Purchase. New Orleans grew rapidly with influxes of American, African, French, and Creole French, people of French descent born in the Americas, and Creoles of color, people of mixed European and African ancestry. Many of the latter two groups fleeing from the violent revolution in Haiti. For example, the 1809 migration brought 2,731 whites, 3,102 free persons of African, African descent, and 3,226 additional enslaved individuals to the city, doubling its French-speaking population. Take a look at how many slaves were, were came that year. It was a major uh, slave trade hub. 18th century colonial Louisiana had a completely different slave trade pattern than that of the 13 colonies. Louisiana's slave trade was governed by the French Code Noir, which gave unparalleled rights to slaves. The Code Noir forbade uh, interracial marriages, but interracial relationships were formed in New Orleans society. The mulattoes became an intermediate uh, social caste between the whites and the blacks. When control of Louisiana shifted to the United States, the Catholic social norms were deeply rooted in Louisiana. The contrast with predominantly Protestant parts of the young nation, where English norms prevailed, was evident. The Americanization of Louisiana resulted in the mulattoes being considered as black, and free blacks were regarded as undesirable. After the Civil War, with a relatively large educated black, um, including a self-described Creole or mixed-race population that had long interacted with the white population, racial attitudes were comparatively liberal for the Deep South. Why the accent? Well, they spoke a lot of French. In the early part of the 20th century, the Francophone character of the city was still much in evidence, with one 1902 report describing one-fourth of the population of the city speaks French in ordinary um, daily talking, while another two-fourths is able to understand the language perfectly. So that's quite a bit. Jazz. It began in New Orleans. From 1897 to 1917, New Orleans' red light district sprung up, uh, sprang up in an attempt to better organize and regulate the city's illicit activity. The result was an area called Storyville. African-American men were banned from both black and white brothels, but counterintuitively, many musicologists believe that Storyville was integral to the origin of the music. 
The theory stands to reason, since all the best houses hired pianists and even small bands to keep the atmosphere lively and entertain their patrons, Molly wouldn't otherwise be occupied. This is Louis Armstrong. Look at that guy. Look at those socks. He is a cool cat. He's kind of at the height of his early fame and power when he was just um, becoming a real cool dude. And uh, look at him. He knows it. Uh, he was born in 1901 in the poorest section of town. We talked about the um, the French Quarter and then the areas behind it. There's the Treme uh, neighborhood and um, things like that. And it was kind of over in there. It was the poorest section of town. He took work with the Karnofsky family at age seven. He was sent to the Colored Waifs home, which is basically an orphanage um, or a, a, a juvenile um, detention kind of facility at age 12 for firing weapons. Um, and he married a prostitute at age 17. There he is right there. And look at him. Look at this guy's face right there. And look at that guy right there. He knows he is cool. I mean, look at all the other people that are in series, but look at that. Look at that guy. He's like 14, and he knows he's really cool. The Karnofsky, Karnofsky family owned this building, which still stands in New Orleans. You can see this right here is that building right there. Greatest trumpet player in the world by 1923. He invented swing and mixed in the blues. This became the basis for rock, soul, R&B, etc. He knocked the Beatles off the charts in 1964. He, and there's a lot of other different things I have in here. Um, but the next step is to go through, now that you know a little bit more about New Orleans, I gave you a little bit of an overview on Louis Armstrong. The next step is going to be to go and let me read you a um, young adult uh, graphic novel about the life of Louis Armstrong. Um, all right, thanks.